Well, welcome to the, uh, the lecture I'm giving today is the earliest detection, intervention, and prevention of thoracic outlet syndrome. And um, here I am at the Florida Chiropractic Physicians Association. I was here last year and gave a lecture on um, biomechanics and uh, performance. And that same lecture I gave in Malaysia at the World Congress of Sports and Exercise Science last year. So there were doctors and medical physicians from 28 different countries at that conference. And after the lecture was presented, I got invited back and uh, offered a position on their scientific community com committee and a fellowship, an honorary fellowship in, in their uh, medical association. So I think that if you do the work, in other words, in order to give that lecture, I had to read about 30,000 pages of research, and I took about maybe 5,000 pages of notes from the medical science in PubMed on that subject, and so if you do the research and you actually give a very good presentation, I think the medical community is very uh, interested in what you have to say. Uh, first of all, this, this lecture right here is is very important to me because I suffer from thoracic outlet syndrome myself. And because of it, I actually wrote a book on it. Thoracic outlet syndrome is really not like a condition per se. It's an array of different conditions that are related to the upper body, let's say the chest, the shoulder, the neck, and you know, also it involves the arm, and I'll explain that later. But it's very complex, and it's actually very not so not only complex for patients to understand, but it's also very complex for doctors to understand. And you might, you know, see you don't see a lot of people in this room. Sometimes we need uh, to understand what the public is looking for, because right now, currently, thoracic outlet syndrome, those three words used in combination, currently gets 42,000 Google searches per month. Now, if you want to compare that to neck pain, neck pain currently gets 60,000 Google searches per month, and shoulder pain gets 80,000 Google searches per month. So the public is very aware of thoracic outlet syndrome, and they're searching for answers about it as much as neck pain. So it's become a very popular or very the interest is, is rising because lifestyles of the public has changed. You know, before you had a set of keys in your hand to get your car open, get your get into your car and turn it on and also open your keys to your house. And now you have a bag with your notebook computer, you have your cell phone, and then you have a bag on the other hand, and then you have uh, you know, you have to work a computer all day, and so everybody's got remotes, they lay in bed watching TV until the wee hours of the night. And this is putting a tremendous amount of stress on the upper body head and neck. So there's so many people that are getting thoracic outlet syndrome that are very complex. So I'm going to go over it with you in detail. First of all, it's the that the doctors feel that it's either underdiagnosed, it's something people say it's overdiagnosed, and some people say it's you know, misdiagnosed, it's always misdiagnosed. And, and doctors really don't have a good handle on what really thoracic outlet syndrome is. Now, the reason why I know a lot about thoracic outlet syndrome was because I had thoracic outlet syndrome for seven years. I was playing, here's a story for you, I was playing rugby as a 19 year old kid for Las Vegas Rugby Cup. I was 140 pounds and those first four guys right there are called props. And this is, in, this is taken in Las Vegas, it's at the Las Vegas Rugby Club. And those four guys, what they do, I was called the hooker because I was only 140 pounds. The hook, not a hooker like you're thinking, but the hook, you know. Uh, what they do is one prop, you know, stands next to you here and he grabs a hold of your shorts and he lifts you off the ground. And another guy from the other side grabs a hold of your shorts from the other side and lifts you off the ground. And they pick you up like a battering ram. And there's another guy on the other side with those props and then they come together and they ram shoulders together. And that's called scrum. And then there's a, uh, a fellow that is on the side of the scrum that throws that ball into the, into the scrum. And then that hook 
uses his foot to hook the book ball back into his scrum, so, and that's how this play starts. It starts after a penalty or starting a game. So there's a lot of scrums, and in fact, this is such a dangerous uh, play that they've, you know, they've wanted to change it or outlaw it altogether or something. Head and neck injuries are, are very common in this sport. So what happened was we were in Santa Barbara and it rained for four solid days. And in the middle of the field, as you know, fills up with water. So it was six inches deep and we were running through this water all day. So the guys were all a little tired. Well, the scrum collapsed. I, would, I, just, I could just tell I was going to get, you know, when you know you're going to get hurt and you brace yourself. But I went head first into that six inch puddle of mud. And the four props behind me fell on top of me and they all piled on. Well, everybody's real tired. I heard my neck snap. I broke four ribs, three or four ribs in the back and my shoulder here. And I felt my neck snap and I had mud shoved up to my nose and in my mouth. And I literally, I thought I was going to drop because there was so much weight on top of me and let all the air out of my lungs like he got hit in the solar plexus. Can't breathe. And thank God this, this big guy right here, Dave Hammer, grabbed me by the back and literally picked me up out of the water like a fish. And, uh, and, it, uh, and it, what happened was the sideline I was out of the game for a while and this chiropractor came up to me and said, how can I help you? And he helped me. And uh, I'll never forget that. That was the day I decided to become a chiropractor. So I suffered needlessly for many years. I went to national and, you know, guys were adjusting right through the middle of the spine and, uh, you know, we're teaching each other technique and how that goes, and uh, my condition just got worse. And nobody knew how to do a first rib adjustment in the first year of chiropractic. And you only had like four guys that really moved the first rib in that, you know, student clinic. And so I had to drive like an hour to see my father who adjust that first rib, and they pointed it, and that gave me some relief. But um, for seven years, even when I was with my father in practice, I had to suffer from this chronic pain. So I was ready to give up on chiropractic and natural cures. I was ready to try drugs even. I was going to go for the painkillers. And I almost gave up on the profession. And finally, I had to find an answer to my own problem. I had to find an answer, and I found the answer. And I'm going to share that with you. And that's what I've been uh, invited to speak on at 50 medical conferences around the world, including the SENS conference in Cambridge, England, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in London, England. China Medical Conference, Bay, you know, the Beijing a Medical Conference in Sydney, Australia, here and there. It's been quite a, a road, but uh, basically, this is, like I said, one of the most underdiagnosed, one of the most overlooked and misdiagnosed conditions, and it's difficult to manage. And I'll tell you why when we get into this. Medical professions uh, find it the, the most important peripheral nerve compression in the upper extremity. And like I said, you've got 42,000 people a month that are using thoracic outlet syndrome, those three words, to find out what is wrong with them. It affects 8% of the population with women more commonly uh, affecting, you know, if you'd like to, first of all, if you'd like to get my, my uh, references, I can provide them for you. The, the initial uh, discussion of thoracic outlet syndrome started in 1821 by Sir Ashley Cooper. And, um, it was one of the first surgical procedures ever performed was to remove the first rib. And that was uh, back in the early 1900s. There are many names for thoracic outlet syndrome. As you can see, I'm not going to go over all of them. But you know, you've got like about 35 different ways of naming thoracic outlet syndrome, which even complicates it even more. So what we, what we do know is if we go to all the if we go to all the different websites, like the um, Cleveland Clinic, the Mayo Clinic, if we go to um, PubMed, the National Institute of Neurologic Disorders, and stroke, they all say the same thing. Thoracic outlet syndrome is a compression. So it's a compression. And um, that's the first clue as to determining what causes it and how to treat it. It's a compression. So we have to say, okay, what are the different structures or the different tissues that actually can compress the body? And there's really only one, and that's muscles. Muscles are the only tissue that actually can compress the human body. 
No other tissues can. And as a matter of fact, the way that uh, medical physicians, surgeons actually treat thoracic outlet syndrome is that they remove the muscles. The surgical procedure for thoracic outlet syndrome is to cut the um, scalene muscles, remove the first rib, because the scalene muscles elevated the first rib, and also to cut the pectoralis minor muscle. So those that use that procedure, I call it when in doubt, cut it all out. Because they really don't know what it is that caused it, but they figure, well, we'll get a good outcome because this is what we think is causing thoracic outlet syndrome. But I want you to know that, that there are not three muscles that actually compress the thoracic outlet area, there are eight. So even the surgical procedure that is used for thoracic outlet syndrome is, is not, um, is, is not uh, you know, um, directed per specifically to the exact cause. It, the only reason why they don't remove all eight muscles is because there'd be nothing left, their shoulder would be dangling from the skin as a, a use, useless appendage. So that's why they don't do it, otherwise they would. So these are the outcomes of surgery, obviously. If you have a failed surgery, if it was misdiagnosed or poorly diagnosed, or if the doctor had a, a, a complication in the surgery, you, you could end up with chronic lifelong pain because once you've done the surgery, as you know, you can't go back, right? That's what we keep telling the patients. Well, you know what? Why don't you stick it out a little longer? Because once you go to surgery, you can't go back. Progressive weakness could occur. Clot formation you could have paget schroeder syndrome, which is a formation of a clot from the compression that could cause a, a pulmonary emboli. And that, that is a serious problem. You could die from that. Stroke, uh, limb amputation, because the clot actually causes the inability to get the blood to the arm by clotting. Or, um, you know, just uh, failed surgery that leads to spinal stimulators, which obviously is not the answer to pain relief. You know, I've had, I've had patients that have spinal stimulators put in from herniated discs, and then after treat them, they want to have them removed. You know, well, you can put it in, now you have it removed, and you're removing wires from inside the spinal cord area, and they have an actual, like, a TENS unit inside their pelvis area that's surgically implanted in their body. And they carry a remote with them everywhere they go, as you know, to increase the stimulation to the spinal cord area or decrease it. They can become addicted to painkillers. And, um, you know, we know that painkillers that are killing now 33,000 people a year, actually more than car accidents. And more people die from the use of painkillers now than all the street drugs combined. And that happened in 2004, and it keeps rising every year, but nothing is being done. So, complications leading to death could also occur. Now, what you have, unfortunately, is that you see, like, this, this, this picture from, you know, who just had the thoracic outlet syndrome. I'm not going to mention his name, but he had the first rib removal, and he threw a no-hitter. Okay, so, you've got patients that think, oh, well, that's the answer, you know, like, that could even improve your performance. You know, this, this uh, Becker, who was, had thoracic outlet syndrome, the doctor did the surgery, and shortly thereafter, through an old hitter, and so pitchers are opting for the surgery, thinking, well, it's no big deal. Well, it is a big deal, as we know. Those are some complications that we want to bring out to the patients. In fact, if you want this, um, if you want this, um, uh, this list of complications, I will give it to you, and you should print it on a piece of paper and hand it to the patient so they're aware of these complications. Here are the what I did was, I, I wrote that book, so I went through every, all 2,600 research papers on thoracic outlet syndrome, so I'm making this very easy for you. <laughs> you know, you don't have to read all those 2,600 pages of research that I read up until 2 o'clock in the morning every single day for the last two years. I uh, ended up gaining a couple pounds doing it, sitting on my, on my gluteus maximus. But here are the, I have listed the all 16 different approaches taken for therapy for thoracic outlet syndrome. Like I said, if you'd like a copy of this, it saves you a lot of time. Medication, as we imagine, that's the first thing that doctors use. Well, um, you know, my arm is numb, I got pain in my neck, and we say, would you like something for your pain? 
And then they say, well, yeah, I'd like that, you know, okay, because if they don't, they get, feel like they got gypped, you know. That's why doctors like to give pet medication, because they're paying for the treatment, for the examination, now you're walking out with nothing. I think that you should have something for your money. Scalene injections. We now are going to know that since there are eight muscles that actually compress the outlet or contribute to the compression of the outlet, then you know that injection of one muscle or two is not really going to do much. Uh, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory is obviously, that's just a widespread anti-inflammatory, which does help just to reduce the level of inflammation because we know that when inflammation is in the muscle, the nociceptors will pick it up and then there will be a, a, a reaction from the brain to turn on muscle tension because the, the brain doesn't know any better. It just knows that's a prehistoric reflex that it uses these nociceptors as a sensory uh, vehicle to find out whether there's something going on there. Gentle stretch, stretching of the scalenes and the pectoralis muscle. First of all, you know, there, there's a lot of patients that come to me with thoracic outlet syndrome and everybody, and then the first thing that they ask, well, what do they do for you? Well, they stretch my neck. Well, you know what, the attachment of the scaling muscles on the first, second, third, third band threat on the TPs, and then it goes to the first and second rib. So when you stretch it, you know, use this 10-pound weight called the mass, and you stretch it across this spring called the, the spine, and it's a torsion spring, that you know that what's going to happen is that you're going to lift the ribs up even more. So what we have here is we have an elevated rib that they cut out during the surgery, but what we have is we have we have a, a therapists that actually uh, stretch the scalenes by taking this 10-pound load and pulling up on it. So that's obviously um, a mistake. Traction doesn't really address the actual muscles of the shoulder like the subclavius muscle or the pectoralis minor, so that's kind of useless. Nerve gliding, well how can you actually break the reflex of the muscle contractions that are actually causing the thoracic outlet syndrome? Ultrasound and muscle stimulation, how are you going to put muscle stim on a pectoralis minor muscle underneath the pec major? If that's a major cause of thoracic outlet syndrome holding this, what we have here is this is my cell phone. This arm weighs 20 pounds. There's an anticipatory reflex that occurs right just before I'm going to lift my arm from the opposite side that anticipates the movement and stabilizes the shoulder on top of the thorax. The pec minor locks the shoulder down so that you can bring this lever up to your eyes and counterbalance this weight. So you are, here you are holding up to your eyes, hopefully right level, but then the longer you hold it there, the longer the muscle contracts, and then we end up with what? Trigger points and obviously muscle contractions that are permanent that cause compression of the outlet. So obviously, uh, ultrasound and muscle stimulation cannot get to all eight muscles that are involved in thoracic outlet syndrome. A different bra, okay, well, breast augmentation or breast reduction, certainly something to look into, but that is just something that will help to alleviate some of the pressure but doesn't alleviate the condition. Uh, ergonom ergonomic co corrections absolutely have to be made, but by themselves don't correct, correct the actual thoracic outlet syndrome that is currently in uh, currently uh, affecting the patient. The first rib adjustments alone, we're going to go into that. First rib is essential. It's an essential part of the treatment to adjust the first rib off the thoracic outlet to open up the space. Uh, interscaling triangle, allow that uh, the nerves and the um, artery some space. And we know how to do those first rib adjustments very well. So the chiropractor is the ideal physician for this uh, condition. And I'm not saying that because I'm a chiropractor, because I lecture to medical doctors all over the world, 50,000 of them about. And I don't say the word chiropractor, I don't say I'm a chiropractor, I say I'm lecturing on, um, I'm lecturing on inflammation and the connection between depression. My name is Dr. Stockson. Okay, what kind of doctor are you at the end? Well, I'm a chiropractor. Oh wow, okay, okay, that works. So that's how it works. Exercise strengthening, obviously, to strengthen the outlet. 
So what, what, which one of those things reverses the compression? None of them by themselves. So that's why we have such a fail, high failure rate with thoracic outlet syndrome because, and there's other reasons too, because those, those treatments don't work. Now, you might have someone publish a paper saying an 80% improvement, you know, send all your patients to me. And you know what? I don't believe it. Because, you know, you have to, there's a lot of things that we have to include uh, to get it all corrected. There's five different components that have to be met to have a successful um, non-surgical treatment for thoracic outlet syndrome. First of all, why do some doctors recommend surgery? Intractable pain. Doctor, you know, it's like, well, you know, I don't do surgery unless it's absolutely necessary. You know who decides when it's absolutely necessary? Yeah. The patient. You know what? I can't take it anymore. I don't care what you do. Take this, cut this thing out of me. I, I can't stand it. I went to the chiropractor, didn't help me. I went to the physical therapist, didn't help me. The massage therapist, I went to the guy, did some, rubbed some oil on me. I had everything under the sun. They went to uh, check one doctor, one patient I went to 26 different doctors, a hedge fund manager, had every available asset on the planet. And his family was here in America uh, from Holland, and he was um, on a visa, didn't want to leave America, and was doing anything he could to keep his visa. His family was set here in America, and it was like, they had their kids implanted in a school, and he was just going everywhere in the world to find an answer to his thoracic outlet syndrome. And even went to some dungeon clinic in Czechoslovakia. And, I mean, he tried everything. And the reason why, when he finally figured it out, when we explained to him why those things didn't work, so yeah, neurologic deficit, weakness, people, for instance, um, the, uh, I was working for Steely Dan as a chiropractor at their concert. And uh, a man uh, came up to me, the bass player was named uh, Freddie Washington, and he said, you got to help my friend. I said, well, what's wrong with him? Well, we went out for sushi, and he couldn't take the top off the miso soup. And I said, well, okay, well, let's see what's going on. So he walked up. I know who he was, just some older guy, and he had a Rolex watch. Mm -hmm. So I know he's somebody, and he's backstage at Steely Dan. So mm -hmm. I said, well, how can I help you? He said, I don't think he can help me. I said, why is that? He had diabetic neuropathy. I said, well, I hope that it's misdiagnosed, because I don't think I can help you with that. But let's see what's going on. So I said, um, uh, you know, tell me about the history. He said, well, I got it five years ago. And, I, and what happened, tell me about what happened. He said, well, the symptoms started in these two fingers right here. And then the doctor said it was ulnar nerve entrapment. So they did the operation. He oper opened up the ulnar nerve. And then what happened was while he was sitting around recuperating, it started to go up through the, you know, the middle digit, first and second, and the thumb. And then it started on the left side. And I said, you do not have a diabetic neuropathy. And he looked at me like, you know, like, trying to be polite. But he's like, how can you tell, like, just from that? Well, you know that diabetic neuropathy starts peripheral, you know, from, the, you know, distally and it was proximally. So that's not the, the condition. And what he's talking about is something that's climbing up the, at the brachial plexus, okay? And also, I looked at his hand, it was puffy. And so I s did the AdSense maneuver, and it was a trickle of blood, not much, not really a lot. And so I said, I, you want me to prove it? I said, you don't believe me yet. You said, like, three minutes into the discussion, and the guy's been on disability for five years. So uh, I took out this massager, you know, the vibrating massager, the cusser, and I said, I'll prove it to you. And I put a towel, you know, imagine we're downstairs, and there's all these famous musicians and people milling around, everybody from, you know, who's anyone in Chicago loves Steely Dan. So I put the towel on his neck and I put the vibrating massager on him. And then all of a sudden he started screaming over the massager because it's loud, you know. And, he go, and he's on his side and go, he goes, my arm, my arm's on fire, my arm's on fire. And I'm like, oh my God, this guy's in panic. So he calmly and turn off the machine. I said, Mr. Burke, he said, yes, um, didn't you say that your arm was completely numb? He says, yes, I did. I said, well, now it's on fire, isn't it? He goes, yeah, it is. I said, well, that means our feeling is coming back. How about that? He goes, oh, yeah, okay, that works. <laughs> and I said, and I said, now, make a fist for me. He went like that. He goes, oh, my God, I can make a fist. I said, now, do you mind if, you know, could you, 
you know, you're going to, you already got better already. He said, yeah, I'm already better. I said, okay, do you mind doing me a favor? He said, what's that? I said, don't scream anything's on fire in this, in this theater, okay? <laughs> People will be running out of here in the attic. He goes, oh yeah, okay. Do you want me to continue? He said, yes, okay. So I continued with the, with the vibrating massager on the left and the right. He got up and he went like this and I said, okay, because the band was already out there, you know. That was at 8 o'clock. I had been there since 3. And I said, well, let's go up and watch Steely Dan. I love Steely Dan. And you know what he said? He goes, I can watch Steely Dan anywhere, anytime. <laughs> he said, we got to continue with this treatment. I went, ah, okay. So I spent another two hours with him. And then I gave him my card. He didn't call me until like a week. Like a, he goes, I said, what happened? I, it's like a miraculous cure. And the guy never calls me saying, I thought I was cured with the first visit. I said, no, not at all. So as we started treating him, what was happening was that we started to get the feeling back and we started to get the, the, the strength back. Okay? But one day he came in and I said, look, what we're going to do on, on Saturday, I'm going to do a, a special treatment on you, which is, um, I call it pain exorcism. And I'm going to give you like a six hour treatment. We're going to have some breaks in between. And I did six hours of deep tissue on his arm. And his, you know, he turned out to be, he was the, he was the keyboard player and the band leader for Smokey Robinson for 34 years. Yeah. And he retired because from touring and performing, he, was, he performed on over 200 records, including I Will Survive by Gloria Gaynor and Marvin Gaye's records and the Pointer Sisters and everybody that's anyone, because he worked for Motown. Okay, and so now, so he comes into me and I said, okay, we're going to do this like six hour treatment, like we'll do an hour and then we'll take a 15 minute break and another hour. And then that, that, that was on a Saturday and that Monday he came back to me and says, oh my God, I can't believe, what did you do to me? He says, my hand is skin and bones. And he showed it to me. He looked like he was from like concentration camp, you know, like starved. Like his skin and bones, you could see the bones through his skin. And I said, oh, that's normal. And he, he said, how the heck? How could it be normal? I said, that's because the vein was blocked and the fluid had backed up and it covered up the atrophy that you had in your hand because you haven't used your hand for five years. When the fluid left your arm, it showed all the damage. And he looked at me and goes, well, how do I get the muscle strength back? And I said, play the piano. And you could see like a tear well up in his eyes, and it was a very nice moment. So the key here is this failure of a supervised physical therapy program set him in a surgery, or set him in this, this chronic pain situation. So we're going to talk later about Padre Schroeder syndrome and uh, uh, <coughs> surgery performed for all the reasons, all the wrong reasons. You know that um, that that patients that that have Medicare don't get diagnosed with thoracic outlet syndrome for some reason, I don't know why, but people have work injuries or have Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, PPO, get diagnosed with thoracic outlet syndrome. You know how that works? I don't know how that works, but I guess it's because Medicare doesn't pay for the treatment of thoracic outlet syndrome. And that's what they found in a research study in, in, in Washington State, in Washington, D.C., that they said that you know, neurologists who don't do surgery diagnose thoracic outlet syndrome far less than most surgeons. For some reason, I don't know why it's education to read their opinions, but that's basically how it works. So that's what the slide is about. It says, it says a study of 66% uh, of those who had thoracic outlet syndrome part of workman's comp had good excellent results. Now, we don't know whether that's in the first year, second, third, or five years down the line, because long term, we have to look at the long term. What about the other 34%? You know, they're just the same or worse. You know, that's not good, and now I don't like those odds. If I'm going in for surgery, I want to know that I'm going to get something out of it. And I want it to be, I want it to be a, a little higher percentage, at least. How, which one is it? What about this particular doctor here that I'm going to? What's his results? Charrington. And Charrington said the diagnosis made by surgeons according to the reimbursement pattern said in 1992, the edition of neurology indicates, this is a medical uh, journal, patients who have not, who have 
who do not have private insurance or workers' comp are rarely diagnosed with thoracic outlet syndrome. And Medicaid patients almost never undergo surgery. In fact, I had this uh, runner who was a very, uh, very high-level runner from England, and she said that she had a, a clot formation and she had the thoracic outlet syndrome. And we were talking on Facebook, you know, long distance, because she found an interest in and I said, so what happened? She said, well, they went in with the, uh, you know, with the, uh, uh, the clock busters and, you know, and they, and they broke up the clock. And then did you get the, what they usually do is they follow up with the decompression surgery, which is the removal of the scaling muscles and the pectoral spine in the first rib. I said, did you get that? She said, no. I said, next question, do you have health insurance? No. Well, that explains everything, okay? Because you know, uh, unfortunately, that's what happens sometimes. So thoracic outlet syndrome is mainly three different uh, compressions or all of the above. It can be either through elevation of the rib, first rib, by contraction of the scaling muscles, constant contraction, which I call a super contraction. It can become, come from the uh, compression of the clavicle down on top of the uh, neurovascular bundle here, and, and it can come from uh, compression at the pectoralis minor muscle as well. So those are the three areas of compression. But want to know something? Always, I've found that all of those are compressed. And you know why? Because the shoulder, as you know, works in a symphony. And once one muscle group is in a, a spasm, they're all in a spasm. And you know, Here's another thing which is kind of crazy, and I'm going to tell you later, but I just throw it out there now. But I don't know if you're aware of this, but you should be with your anatomy. But the pec minor attached to the coracoid process in the first, second, or third, fourth, and fifth ribs. And by the way, it causes pain between the shoulder blades. So if you're just adjusting the first, second, and, or third, fourth, and fifth ribs without actually uh, treating this cantilever that flips them, then you're going to be adjusting them until their insurance runs out. You have, to, you have to address the pec minor by laying them on their side and going up underneath the pec major and doing the deep tissue. There was a football player that came from a major school. He was like broke all the records in California for a quarterback. And his father was an uh, MD, and he was practicing in uh, Thailand. I did a lecture there, and his chiropractor was there, his nice guy, and he said, you know, like, you got to help this kid because he's got a full scholarship at 50,000 a year, and they're going to do surgery on him for thoracic outlet syndrome, and I know you know that. So I said, okay, send him over. So him and his mother came out, and they said, we'll do it in three days. Imagine that. I'll tell you how we do it. So what happened was the kid came out, and they said, well, you know, the doctor said that he had this, this, this vein that was popped out on his arm, and that um, they did these, uh, these three di diagnostic... Uh, you know, tests, imaging studies, and they said that they that they saw that the uh, that, that the subclavian vein was obliterated, and that uh, and 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 the other thing was that uh, he needed to have that vein reconstructed with surgery. He's only 19 years old. You know how could it, because it was full of scar tissue, and so I had his father on the phone, his medical doctor, and I said, now how do you how do you get scar tissue? that obliterates the vein on a 19-year-old. He said, yeah, and I said, could you please like put those three studies out in front of you? And we're talking, he goes, could you please show me the word scar tissue on the studies? And he said, well, I don't see it. And I said, yeah, because there, it, it's, it, it, it's not there. It's obliterated because the pec minor is laying on top of the subclavian vein, of course, He's getting an MRI, he's laying on his back, with his shoulder, trashing him with a uh, subclavian vein. And it's not obliterated, it's just, it's pressure on it. And he doesn't know whether it's obliterated. What is the word obliterated? What does it come up with these words? And I said, where's the word scar tissue? He said, I don't see it. I said, well, it's because there's not any scar tissue there. He said, how is it possible that the doctor lied to me? I don't know, but he lied to you. <laughs> what can I tell you? And that's exactly what happened. So the kid came out, we treated him for 30 hours in a period of three days. And that is possible. 
and it recovered at 100 percent. And by the way, when we did this, when we checked for that um, that vein that was that was engorged, how exciting was that? He really pulled his arm up and goes, "Well, look at it right there. It's right there. You can see it. it's popping out." I said, so "He goes, look the other one up." Okay, and I said, "It's not there." He goes, "It's not there. We're looking in the mirror in the gym." And I said, "Well." That's because you have a restricted range of motion on this left arm. I said, now let's bring, he had it right here, the other one. So I said, now let's bring this one back to where the other one is. Oh, there it is again. There's that engorged vein. He goes, you're right, I do have a restriction on my left arm. I said, it's not a vein, it's a tendon. Ding, 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 ding. I went like that. I said, forget about that engorged vein. That's not there. You, Conjured up in your own mind, and the doctor agreed with you. I don't know how he did it. That's the confusion. So you've got the neuro, you've got four different types of thoracic outlet syndrome. You want, you want my honest opinion on that? This whole thing is that, you know, who cares whether it's neurogenic or it's venous or arterial or disputed? The bottom line is disputed means that you say it's thoracic outlet syndrome, and the IME doctor said it's disputed. That's what that diagnosis is. He thinks that you know what you're doing. Well, the bottom line is that whether it's the, the all three structures kind of go through the same tunnel. So how could it be one or the other? That's what I'd like to know. Plus, you got eight muscles that actually compress the area. So regardless of whether it's like affecting nerves or artery or vein, we just need to get the pressure off. And we need to find the muscles that are causing the pressure, and then we need to treat them. So None of that is really that important for the treatment. It's just that they they like to like um, wow the patient. Like, we have the neurogenic type of thoracic outlet syndrome, by the way, and I diagnosed that because I checked it. So you know the patient's wowed by that while they're kind of like lulled to sleep. By the, the what's most important is to get the compression off the outlet, and so that's what you have to tell the patient. You say, well, neurogenic. Did they spend a lot of time talking about that? Yes, they did. Well. That's great, but what about spending time talking to you about how to get rid of the problem? Yeah, let me go over that. So, the main thing is the compression of the neck, upper back, shoulders, and chest, leading to a narrowing of this outlet where the neurovascular bundle goes, causes, you know, fingertip uh, 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 tingling, you know, a lot of times it's in the, the, the fourth and fifth digit, it mimics um, uh, ulnar nerve neuropathy, it mimics six nerve roots, seventh nerve root, T1 nerve root compression. It um, also mimics hyperabduction syndrome. So when we get into this, you're going to see that there are over 30 different conditions that it could be that you have differentially diagnosed to make sure you're on the right track with the treatment. And sometimes you see wasting of the muscles of the hand, like what we did with Sonny Burke, by the way, I have permission to talk about it, gave me a signed written release. You know, so symptoms can be in one arm or both. Now, if you have numbness in both arms and there's no trauma, you might want to look at thoracic outlet syndrome. If it's a pancreas tumor, it's on one side or the other. Okay. So when you're differentially diagnosing, if there's no trauma, they have a desk job, or they're a kid on the phone all the time, and it's on the one side, then you know it's probably thoracic outlet syndrome just from the history. So sometimes you can diagnose this from the history just because you kind of know uh, what kind of person you're dealing with and um, you don't have any trauma. Even if you have trauma, it still can be thoracic out outlet syndrome. First of all, I'm going to give you a little section of the lecture I gave in Malaysia on the different, the engineering of the human body. First, we have to understand, in order to understand how to, to how thoracic outlet syndrome develops and how to actually uh, it completely is to understand the engineering of the human body. The first uh, thing we have to answer these questions like how is how does the body protect itself from impacts? Like the average person takes 10,000 steps per day. Those are 10,000 collisions with the earth where gravity is yanking the body down to the earth and colliding with the ground. Runners, that's 26 miles, 26,000 impacts with the ground. I am a barefoot runner, so I run without shoes right on the solid concrete just to improve my health. How about that? And I run in zigzag patterns to pick up the suspension system muscles 
of the tibialis posterior, the peroneal muscles, to ensure that that suspension system is maximally uh, elevating my arch and maintaining a strong spring mechanism on my foot. So I've lectured on that in uh, uh, Malaysia and uh, Australia and in Bangkok, Thailand. And then after I lectured in Bangkok, the next day I ran a 10K at the, at the, um, at the, at the Ministry of Health. <laughs> Here I am, you know, uh, you know, like a, a doctor and from the West, and all of these third world people are, have these fancy shoes, and I'm running barefoot down the uh, street. You know, it's a little bit odd, but that's uh, kind of how you prove the point. How is it designed to recycle energy for maximum efficiency? Uh, we'll get into that. How is it engineered to provide spaces for so bones don't bang or grind or compress nerves? And we know that thoracic outlet syndrome is a compressive disorder. So what we're looking at is how are we, how is this engineered? How is that tunnel allow the same passion of nerves, same thing with the herniated disc, by the way. So we're looking at how is the mechanism now controlled? The movement patterns are stored in the brain. How does the nervous system sense and react to different strain positions and movements? How does the nervous system react to, um, you know, these things make is very important. important. How can we program it? And how does the nervous system modulate the tension on the body's spring mechanism when we're doing different activities? For instance, let's say that, that you and I are running barefoot in the grass, okay? And I change it up and I say, well, let's run from the grass to the concrete. And I know how to do that, so I'm very comfortable with it. And I'm at ease and I'm relaxed. And you're looking at the concrete saying, oh my God. <laughs> I'm going to have a heel fracture, I'm going to have a stress fracture, or just severe pain from running on the concrete. And so you get stressed where I'm relaxed, and you tense up, right? And so when you tense up, you compress this spring mechanism. When in fact, there's two different um, uh, ways that the body can change the tension on the spring which is called spring stiffness, which allows for maximum efficiency and quickness. And then there's spring compliance. Spring compliance is where the body uses the nervous system actually takes uh, the muscles and relaxes them to allow a maximum amount of space to put the impact in. So spring compliance opens up a lot more space to be able to allow me to run on the concrete. So I'm going to make my body more compliant when I'm running on the concrete. You're going to make it stiffer, which is the opposite of what you need to do, and that's why you're going to get injured. Barefoot running is bad for you. Do you understand spring compliance and spring stiffness? No, I just thought you'd run. No. Did you get nervous when you ran barefoot for the first time? Oh, yeah. Well, that's probably why you got hurt. Because you have to go the opposite. You've got to be completely relaxed to get that, get that impact in the body. So the last five years, the most of the most advancements in medicine have been arthroscopic surgery, the use of screws and plates, and you've seen those on your x-rays, right? You see the one and a half inch screws look like you got it from a hardware store? That's kind of brutal, you know, I mean, the patients don't, are not aware of the fact that once you sign on the dotted line before you walk in that surgery, that you could come out with screws in your neck. You have to explain that to them and show that to them. Because they don't have to know the gruesome reality of surgery. Surgery is not, you know, these little laser beams, or we're going to use these laser beams, and we're going to a laser. And you know, in reality, they're putting a, a metal plate and they're attaching screws, and the body's not moving anymore. So, joint replacement surgeries, digital x rays, and 3D models with MRIs and CT scans. These are the three models that I'm going to explain to you. First of all, the medical profession uses a model called the inverted pendulum model, which mainly says that the body use, it moves as a series of levers. And that was Dr. Borelli's uh, uh, that, that, that decided that. And that inverted pendulum model, like let's say that if I, I have my foot here, when I let go, the elastic recoil mechanism automatically swings my leg through and puts the step in where it should be. If I turn my body to the side, it's like, oh, you're going to have, a, you know, it's going to go back and forth and then come to a stop. But really, if we didn't have gravity and that friction, the body would just keep going back and forth like a pendulum. 
but the friction called damping stops it. That's called damping. And what happened was the lever series model was 340 years ago, 1685. Actually, Borelli was actually, uh, there's a Borelli Award that's given by the Association of Biomechanics. Then it came out of the spring mass model in 1989 because plyometrics came to the United States by, by Veroshansky and all these athletes were jumping and hopping. So they were putting this compressive force on the body to actually high, high force compression on the body to actually in, you know, increase the speed and, and, and uh, the ability to take up impacts. That was, now it's, it's like you have resistance exercise and you have plyometrics. That's because resistance exercise uses levers and plyometrics uses spring mechanisms. Now you get it? Mm -hmm. The body is not a lever system. It's a lever system and a spring mechanism. And the spine is a spring. It's actually a torsion spring. So if you take a towel and you turn it like this and like, oh, that's how this body works when you run and walk. It conserves energy through these elastic recoil mechanisms. And those same mechanisms that create the openings for the thoracic outlet to allow the neurovascular bundle to pass through safely and the nerves to pass through the area of the intervertebral foramina, those are governed by the compression on the spring mechanism. Is that understood? So when we make adjustments, we're making adjustments on a natural spring. I came up with the integrated spring mass model because this spring mass model said that the body was a spring from the waist down the thorax and the head were the mass, that's the Harvard model. And they said that the body was linear springs, and that's not correct. It's a, uh, and then they didn't even have the foot and ankle modeled into the, uh, the model. So the integrated spring mass model actually models the human foot as a suspension system and, um, uh, and, and also models the spine as a torsion spring and the whole body as a torsion spring you know, a torsion spring like you said at the top. And so I gave this lecture in Malaysia and um, it came off pretty good. They actually um, are giving me a fellowship and I a fellowship this year and we put on their scientific committee. And I was actually chairing the whole program, introducing the medical physician to the program. So that's what happened. How is it possible that we can withstand the impacts with the lever system? It's completely impossible because levers don't withstand impacts. Levers don't provide any mechanism for recycling of energy. So like if you hopped from foot to foot, like this, you know, for 26 miles, you'd be exhausted after 250 feet if you're really in shape, maybe even less. How come we can do it 26 miles? It's because we store and release, store and release, store and release through spring mechanisms. That's how we do running. So they say that running's bounding through compliant with bent legs, that's not true. So at age of 26, this is Dr. Stephen Press from, um, from New Jersey. We had a, a conference in, um, for chiropractors to go to Russia to study at the National Institute of Physical Culture and Sport Sciences, 1988, to study under Dr. Veroshansky about these spring mechanisms. And here's the Borelli model. It looks like a lever system. The foot is like a long lever. It doesn't really move much. In fact, the foot has 33 joints and three arches, as we know. And so the Borelli model is outdated. This is the spring mass model saying that the body is a mass from the waist up and these linear springs here. So that's, that's actually inaccurate. The integrated spring mass model actually models all the components, and that's that model. So what we're looking at is a, a spring that actually can compress and mod be modulated the tension based upon what activities that we want to do. If we're standing at a six foot height and we want to jump down, we know that we have to do something to the spring to absorb that impact. Just like we were running, you and I, you tensed up, I loosened up. Because I understand how the spring works and I know how to modulate it and I know what I have to do to the spring to modulate it to be able to achieve that goal, that activity. So when you understand it that way, it makes sense because it's based on the laws of physics and nature. How's that? So the idea here is that you cannot really refute it because you'd have to say that, well, the laws of physics are wrong and the laws of nature are wrong, and that's pretty impossible. 
So that makes it all easy to do. And it's easier to explain to patients, and I'll tell you, when you explain it to them this way, they go, that makes sense. And anything else doesn't make sense because it doesn't abide by these laws. So when they start to tell you, well, you know, like your hip is needing to be replaced because of old age, then you have to say, well, why is my other hip okay? Uh, that's just what the doctor told me. Now I'm going to move through this. So this is the spring mass model, and this is the different springs in the human body are the menisci, the cartilage, and actually when you run, the cartilage actually compresses. They actually come into contact, and uh, people don't realize that. The spinal cord, cord column is a torsion spring, the lower limb is a torsion spring, because you land in the center point, and then you spin off of it. So, the, the, how is it possible that, you know, you have this girl that works in a computer lab, and she has thoracic outlet syndrome, which is a compression of the neurovascular bundle, but you have a football player that goes full speed into another player with his shoulder and bangs into the guy, and he has no problems. Because it's built on spring mechanics. And the compression comes from the brain turning on the compression, and that's why where we come in. So the head is the mass, and here, here, the, the, here's where the nerves pass underneath. And, that, and why are the only structures that compress the human spring as muscles? That's why they cut them out. So here's, here's the eight muscles now. You don't have to write these down, but these are the eight muscles that either com, uh, compress the thoracic outlet or contribute to the threat compression. So if you're going to try to treat thoracic outlet syndrome or you have a neck problem, uh, and you're wondering if it's a borderline thoracic outlet syndrome, then, well, maybe you should check all these muscles, these eight, to ensure that you've relieved all eight with your deep tissue. Because if you only do the scalenes, and you, only do the, and you don't do the pec minor, well, if you don't do the pec minor, you're really, that's a lackluster treatment, okay? And if you don't address the rest of them, I'm telling you, it, it's, just, it's just mediocre treatment, in my opinion. And I, I just really kind of embarrassed that you're not really doing it because it's you have to get all the muscles that are contributing. Otherwise, you could lose the patient to surgery when it's not necessary. And they could have helped them. And they you never know. You say, oh, I'm feeling a little better. And then, you know what? A year and a half later, you meet them at the Home Depot or at the grocery store. Yeah, I had the surgery. Well, it got better, but, you know, then it got worse. And I tried something else and I went to surgery. That's what you hear. And you don't want that to happen. So, there's some muscles that attach in the, uh, the neck, some muscles that attach in the shoulder, and shoulder to the chest, and here are the only ones they operate on. So they're going to clip these three muscles, when in fact you have eight muscles that contribute to the compression of the outlet. That's why it's in ineffective. And so, this tension on the spring has to be removed. Weakness occurs when you um, have muscle weakness which we'll go into that later. So, what I was trying to figure out is that, how is it that we end up with this compression with the muscles? And what I was looking into is trying to figure out whether posture is in fact reflexive or if it's a learned behavior. Like you say, okay, stand up straight. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a learned behavior. Is that good posture? No. Okay, so what I found out was that they did studies back in 1908 or 1920 or something. And what they did was that they clipped the, the, the connection between the, um, uh, the cerebral cortex and uh, helping the midbrain. And uh, then they determined after that you know, how it was effect on posture. And there was no effect on posture. So what they determined was that posture was actually controlled by the midbrain, not the cerebral cortex. It was actually reflexive. So when you're looking at it, you say, well, okay, what reflexes? Now, reflexes are there to help us. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to determine how is it that the reflex causes tension in the muscles that leads to the, the to the compression of the neurovascular bundle of the thoracic outlet syndrome. So what we have to do is we have to say, okay, um, where, where, is, where is this happening? So it happens automatically. So this is where we search 
Charles Sherrington was the one that did the research in 1906. And so posture allows you to maintain your upper right alignment. And we always say, oh, chiropractic do these screenings, stand up, put the plumb line, check your posture, okay, that sort of static evaluation, and you see what you know your belly stick out or your head like this or whatever. And what controls that posture is the reflexes and also uh, their activities, their weightlifting and whatever they do. But the idea here is to determine uh, you know, what postures they're doing that causes the, the reflex reaction that leads to the stimulus of the muscle to compress down on the outlet. So the posture orientation is what we're looking for. And then we have to look at the equilibrium factor. That is that there's a balance of strength between all the muscles in the body to allow you to say, have equilibrium. So if you say, okay, posture is a learned behavior of its reflexive, how does one sit to alleviate the Rascalic syndrome or any type of uh, problem of the, of, the, of the human body? Okay, so we say, well, we're going to give them a, we're going to give them one of these um, low back things, you know, supports, a lumbar, a lumbar support, so that they need that like this. And then you say, well, how is gravity reacting to the spring mechanism? Well, gravity is reacting to the spring mechanism by saying, there's a 10 pound load that's dangling from the scalene muscles. <laughs> well, you know, something's got to hold that up. So the scalene's got to contract constantly. And that now we have that the development of the trigger point, or what we call super contraction. And so, um, you know, patients will come in and they'll, and they'll say, and I don't even, I'm so busy, and they go, they're like that. And they say, so how long have you had the problem on your left side? How did you know that? Because that's their tendency to sit like this. So they have a 10 pound head, which is a mass that's dangling. The spring is on an angle. The body is on an angle. And there's a reflex that actually sets the head on center. We call it the writing reflex, right? Okay. And so basically what's happening is that the body's on an angle all day long. And then the, the you know, the eyes have to come to, to, to um, the, the horizon. And the head has to be perpendicular to earth, so this is their reflex. That's the labyrinthian reflex, okay? So you say, well, listen, uh, uh, honey, you've got these uh, five uh, carpenter's levels inside your head. And they're in this little cave called the labyrinth or cavern. And what happens is they got, it's like a hula hoop, and it's got like fluid in it. And when you go like this with the hula hoop, it slips around. And just imagine that hula hoop got these little hairs in it. And as that water slides around, it trips these hairs like this, okay? And then it sends a message to the brain, where you're at, what you're doing. And then it makes corrections, therefore. Oh, wow, that's really interesting. And that's the reflex, of, that's the, the labyrinthian reflex. So those are the ways that you can ex explain that. The sensory receptors like the skin receptors, visual receptors, the eyes, auto, uh, uh, auto, <laughs> Ocular vestibular reflex, um, somatosensory will be like, you know, Golgi reflex organs or the spindle cells, and your vestibular system obviously we just went over. And so the somatosensory is the skin receptors, and we already went over that. And here's the muscle spindle cells, and I know that you guys do spindle cell work. And so here we have the, how the reflex is set up. The spindle cell is a cell that has nine or ten filaments inside and the sensory nerve is wrapped around it and when the muscles are kind of intertwined in that spindle cell. You know it's interesting I found out that every human being has the same amount of spindle cells in each muscle. Like everyone has 502 spindle cells in the gastrocnemius. Every infant has 502 spindle cells. You know because they did the autopsies to determine how many spindle cells there were in the body and different muscles. Some muscles that are used for fine tuning like at the base of the skull have a higher concentration of spindle cells so they can make the adjustments of these reflexes. So when you're doing you know, work on the cervical spine, upper cervical, it's very meaningful work. It's very meaningful work because it affects those reflexes, very important. And so these spindle cells react to strain. They're called, I call them strain gauges of your body. And patients say, Ooh, I like that. That makes sense. And these strain gauges determine how much strain there is and tell the brain, there's too much strain here. 
And the brain has to react to that by causing some type of muscle spasm. Then muscle, muscle where they have to make the adjustments. Then you have the vestibular system, which we just went over here. Here we have the um, uh, ampulla, and then you have these hairs. There's like 30,000 hairs in each uh, semicircular canal. And they have the nerves that come off the hairs that actually show you what position you're in. And that's how you know whether or not you're you know, on an angle or if you're straight up perpendicular to earth or horizontal. Horizontal or perpendicular is the only way to be not to trip these spindle cells or trip these spindle cells or these uh, vestibular system. So you have the vestibular ocular reflex, which is based on, on the movement of the eyes to right itself to the target. Then you have the vestibular spinal reflex, which uh, provides compensating movements to um, maintain the head and the posture. Uh, according to like what angle of the, the earth is, so, like if you're standing on a slope or if you're sitting sideways or your body's on an angle, the vestibular palate reflex mainly for the limbs to adjust the head so it maintains perpendicular gravity and so on and so forth. See, this is a great image of a child who's on an angle but that the head is perpendicular to earth and you can see that the eyes are at the horizon. And you know, it's interesting to watch how people get up from a lane when they fall down. You know, when they fall down, you know, you fall and you're on the ground. And you don't realize it, but the first thing that comes up is your head. Then the head rights itself and the body follows. That's a reflex. That actually is not something that you do, uh, you know, based on learned behavior. That's done for you. Thank God it does it that way. Because that's how it works.